Welcome back to the Mid Am Podcast. Uh, we're your host. I'm Tyler Munz, and across on the other side of the screen from me is my good friend Nathan Furumasu. And um, today we are joined by a very special guest, one of my favorite follows on Instagram, uh, Drew Cooper. Um, and if you don't know Drew, um, he's one of the longest hitters uh, in golf. That's not like a prolonged drive guy. Um, so we. Um, we're super excited to to have him uh, on the show just to talk about all the stuff that we um, we talk about as as mid am guys. So Drew, thank you so much for um, spending some time with us today. We really really yeah, appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. It'll be fun. Awesome. Uh, well, I I we I know we sent over um, some questions. Obviously, we'll um, just kind of uh, it'll be more of a conversation. But um, I uh, I'll have Nathan uh, kick us off here, and we can kind of get into your golf story. Yeah, that sounds good. Perfect. Cool. Sorry for the awkward radio silence earlier. I am s- fresh off of some pneumonia, so I'm like kind of not fully there mentally, but we're <laughs> we're still, you know, we're here. We're doing the thing. Um, it's okay. There's but, a visual aspect yeah. of the show too. So we got yeah, the wave. I waved. I waved. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Well, we like to start off kind of all of our our interviews that we do together with just finding out, um, people's story and, you know, find out your, your history with golf. You know, how'd you get to be the fastest amateur on the planet or, you know, right. I think somebody's, somebody's deemed you that before I'm sure. Yeah. So, um, I'm sure it's not know. true at this point, but, um, well, yeah, like my, my golf background is long, I guess, really. Um, my dad was a college golfer. He's got stories of playing against Mac O'Grady and stuff, um, in long beach. So like, he had a golf club in all of me and my brother's hands when we were like really little, you know, a a persimmon driver with a steel shaft cut down, um, at Torrey Pines driving range when we were like five. So we all hated it. We all played basketball and soccer and, you know, surfed and did all that stuff. But like he had it, he had us on golf courses. He had us hitting golf balls. Then I sort of like did the team sport thing all the way through basically until high school. Um, never touched golf clubs, like on my own accord, like never did anything. And then like the end of eighth grade, ninth grade, I started enjoying it because I realized like I could do it however I wanted to do it by myself. Like there was no coach who could bench me for shooting a three or, you know, whatever. Like I I had this real, like, I don't know what you want to call it. Like, uh, enjoyment of the, like the solitude and like, I controlled everything. So eighth ninth grade i picked it up quite a bit started playing and taking lessons um like barely kind of made my high school golf team as a freshman but like i basically made it because the coach saw potential not because i was any good like i i shot like 50 or something one of the nine hole qualifying rounds so like i was not i was like all over the place but then like through high school i kind of got progressively a little bit better um, played golf on like a really good high school team at Torrey Pines high school. I always joke that like of, of the guys I played with, I think I'm, I think I'm literally the only person who didn't play division one college or didn't get a college golf scholarship. I think of my whole team. I think I'm literally the only guy. Um, wow. so the, the ending of golf was basically me getting burnt out and I was at CIF or state championships for high school as a senior. I was playing poorly and then I think I hit like a ball out of bounds on a par five and I was a little frustrated at that point. So then I hit another driver out of bounds and then I hit another driver out of bounds and then I walked down and lost like a couple more balls and just packed up the bag and left mid round and just like gave the guys my scorecard and quit for basically a decade. Didn't touch my clubs. Um, So that was, and then I I got back into golf when we moved up here um, to Northern California as something like, I don't want to say like as a hobby, but as like, just like, uh, this is fun. Like, let's get out of the house, um, and play golf again. And then I sort of got hooked again. So that's, that's kind of like the long story. Um, and then the, like the hobbyish enjoyment thing went until I had my kids. When I had my kids, I was working a job with a force plate company and I was like slowly becoming like frustrated with where that was going. The The company was great. The people were great, but I just wasn't like super happy doing what I was doing. I think you couple that with the stress of having twins. We were renovating our house. 
Um, we were basically living out of a suitcase. COVID hit. Like there was just like a like a mountain of stuff that happened all at the same time. And that's when I like I got sort of like almost like introspective and looked at like what do I want to do? Why do I want to do it? And so I signed up for Dana Dahlquist's coaching certification that he ran some special over COVID because like there's nothing to do. Um, loved it. Like loved the way he looked at golf and the golf swing. Him and Josh were fantastic. Um, I was bugging Dana for maybe six months to a year to get a lesson and to shadow and to like, can we just like meet in person? And then we finally did. And like the very first time I shadowed a couple guys and then took a lesson at the end. And like immediately he was like, you ever think about doing long drive? And I was like, no, like never. Um, those guys swing like seven irons faster than I swing my driver. And he was like, you, you should think about it. And like, I left that day and I told my buddies and I was like, I don't know why he thinks that like I maybe get 180, 185 mile an hour ball speed, maybe when I'm trying to kill it. And my buddies were like, oh, you should do it. Like you should do this. And that's how like the Instagram thing started. Cause my background, I was like, well, I would train differently. Like I wouldn't do the same stuff in the gym that I'm currently doing. And they were like, you should just, you should just like show everybody what you do and just see what happens. And so like, that's how I am here today, basically. That's you know, awesome. Funny. Yeah. Roundabout yeah. story. Very cool. I mean, that, that jives with, uh, like I was mentioning before, that jives with a, a, some of what we've talked about previously on our podcast where, you know, we, we really resonate, um, this, this mid am, um, demographic obviously, cause that's the name of what we named our podcast after it, but you know, people who, who have sort of a storied history with golf, um, and not always, you know, good not always great some it's and it's there's always some fluctuation to it that's um just interesting to see the paths that that people take um back to this game and uh i i was thinking when when you're talking you know like the getting kids into into golf and interested in golf is is a fascinating subject especially for you know again, people maybe in our demographic where we're, we have kids now and, you know, maybe in a couple of years, we're going to be wanting like to spend time with our kids on the course and things like that. How do you, how do you make them not hate it is always sort of like a, an interesting, interesting topic, I think. Yeah. And like, I'm seeing it now because I've got three-year-old, almost four-year-old twins. And it like, it makes you appreciate like how big the game is, like how big the holes are how just like enormous the whole landscape is because it's like, it's a struggle for them to like get from the cart to the green. Like it's just watching them like deal with like the size of it is really interesting. Yeah. And then like the slowness, like you couple those two things and it's, it's a little challenging. So like I, I take stuff for them to play with. Like we let them play in the sand. Mm -hmm. um, we'll take other balls. Like, like we'll let them drive the carts, even though they're three, you know, our hands are on the wheel or whatever. But like you basically do whatever you can to make the thing fun because yeah. otherwise it's just like they can't grasp the the size of it all. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's good... um I was just gonna say, I think that's like one of the the um inter or uh, unique aspects of golf that I don't think it's a ton of like play is is the the pace of it, like and not just like ripping on slow play, but but especially for kids and the in what you're competing with for their attention, you know, at, you know, even at three and four, but especially as you get into, yeah. you know, elementary school, middle school age, like to, to ask someone who is used to having, you know, their attention span chopped Just up into 10 to 15 second chunks to be like, yep. Hey, I need you to lock in for four and a half hours. Yeah. Um, that's, that's like yeah. becoming tougher and tougher. So I, I do think that, yeah, like the question of how do you get a kid who, who, you know, you're going to be competing with some, you know, some major distractions, um, as, as time goes on, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's probably the, the, one of the bigger questions I'd imagine anyone in our stage of life, um, would want to ask themselves, especially if they want to be able to share this passion with with their children right definitely yeah i mean i can even make fun of myself like i one of the reasons i quit in high school like at the end of high school was like the frustration of it all like you want to get better and you're not getting better or 
for me, people were telling me I should be better than I am because my swing looked a certain way. And you just, like, I just got to a point where I was so mad. I was probably too immature. Like I probably grew up a lot between quitting and coming back to where now it's like, it's a lot more stress-free, a lot more enjoyable than it ever was when I was younger, when I really like wanted to be good. Now it's just sort of like, if I'm, if I get better, cool, but like, it's fun trying to see what happens regardless of what actually ends up happening. But it's like, it's a a very mature game. Yeah. Uh, Going back a little bit, just on your, your, your your history with the game as it relates to speed, because I would, you know, that's, Essentially, I'm not not to boil you down to, uh, you know, uh, uh, one you thing. Um, you hit ball one far. thing, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, one dimensional character, but you are known for your speed. And and even you saying when when uh, when when Dana said, you know, have you ever thought about long trend? You said, no, no. I mean, I, I you know, I might hit 185. It's like, well, actually, that's, re- you know comparatively right, right. to everyone else in the world 185 <laughs> is fast and if that's what you were doing before you really started focusing on speed um you know w- was that something that y- you were always just a pretty fast you just had a pretty fast swing or or was that something that came kind of later on when you got back into it okay b- both so like my dad was always like a massive proponent of like being athletic swinging fast he would always point to guys like Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer who hit the ball further than everyone. And like, he would always talk about Jack Nicholas was a baseball player. And Arnold could do anything. So like my dad was like a huge, huge advocate of like a very athletic swing. And he always had me doing like way back when, I mean, you'd basically call it a step drill, but essentially mm. he'd have me take a golf club and hit it. Like it was like a, like I was batting. So he was like, imagine a baseball batter and he picks his front foot up and you get all your weight on your back foot. Now we, we know now it's pressure and this and that, but like back then he had the same relative idea. So like I was like a longer guy in high school, like one of the longer guys, but then I quit playing. I picked up powerlifting and I got like, I think I graduated high school, six, four, 178, something like that, 180 some pounds. I came back and I was, well, okay. I had been 6'4", 242 pounds. And then I had lost weight back down to like 215 when I picked golf back up. But I was like substantially stronger. Like, mm. like couldn't, like night and day difference in strength, you know? Um, and was was automatically faster, like immediately. I was playing with the high school clubs at the same golf course I played. And I was just like laughing, just like giggling to myself when I hit a good tee shot, how much further the ball was going, you know, and you're talking, I still have the driver. I actually could show you the driver. Yeah. Let's see it. Like this is the high school driver and I still have it. The Cobra? Yeah. 983. Okay. Yeah. The same stuff. And like just seeing the ball soar past places I used to hit from. Mm. So yeah, getting stronger, like played a big difference for me from being like a longer guy to like noticeably longer than people I played against. I think that's a, I think that's a something we're seeing nowadays with just like sports and performance in general. Like the kids who uh, are less, are less specialized early on and do more just general athletic development, um, general coordination, developing that more like explosive power than when they sort of funnel themselves into a specific sport later in life, they tend to be the faster ones, the stronger ones, the more well-rounded players. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's kind of serendipitous for you that you sort of um, well, not, not really. Cause it sounds intentional that your dad was kind of like, Hey, do all these different things and, and, you know, experience and develop in these different ways. He might not have been super intentional beyond, right. Hey, well, this is what the good, the, like the greats do, but right. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. And so, yeah, it makes sense. You know, you go, you get bigger and all of a sudden you have more power and more, more stopping ability really, you know? And right. So very cool. Yeah. 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 And like to, to your point though, like the, the vast, like, difference in sports, like gives you this large motor pool to pull from. And if you talk to people like, uh, I know Dr. Lynn from swing catalyst did a thing with Kelly Slater and he was like talking about the swing and Kelly was like, Oh, that's like when I do a cutback and I, and I press on the board here 
And Dr. Lin's like, sure. Like, I, I don't surf. Like, <laughs> yeah. okay. Hey, Tyler checking in here. At this point in the interview, we had a uh, little bit of technical difficulty and the rest of Drew's audio and video ended up not getting recorded. So uh, thankfully, Drew uh, was able to jump back on with us a couple weeks later. So this is now going to be the second conversation that we had with Drew. The, the second question um, and it, maybe this is like a little, it, it ends up working out that we have to revisit it because it seems like you've, uh, like maybe put slight, slightly more of an emphasis on practice since we last talked. Um, so like, what are you currently working on in your game to, at, at, at more of like a, I think what you would call like a play speed, um, yeah. you know, moving away from just like the, the raw speed into more of like a, being able to play some more target golf. Yeah. So I think that the thing we talked about last time was like the, the analogy between like a hundred mile an hour fastball, like throwing a hundred mile an hour fastball versus the darts. It's like long drive became the hundred mile an hour fastball. It was like, how much can I move my mass, wind up my body, let my joints, like my trail arm get real wide <clears throat> and then let it collapse and, and kind of get wide again. So it's kind of like all these moving parts all over the place just to hit, you know, one or two balls out of six really good, really well. Um, golf, on the other hand, is like like throwing darts. It's like you've got a smaller window for success. Every shot matters. How far you hit it is only like semi-important when you swing it as fast as I do. So like I don't need to hit the ball, quote unquote, far for me. I just need to chip it out there. So the swing became, I guess, more constrained so that I still feel like I can swing with effort and not have all of these like changing positions that need to figure themselves out by the time I make impact. So trying to maintain like a little bit more structure. So my trying to keep my, my trail arm from sort of being really wide and then collapsing through transition. And then, so that it has to extend out back through the ball. So trying to keep it like, I don't know if you've seen the gears or like the athletic motion stuff, like most tour pros don't ever bend beyond 90 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Most long yeah. drivers get in there at like 30. Like, I mean, they're, mm. they're like collapsed totally in and then it comes slinging back out. So that's a big one. And then I'm trying to work on my levels or like my bends and tilts. So I'm trying to stay a lot more neutral and not have things sort of rise and sort of extend way up on the backswing <clears> and then <throat> change all these bends and tilts on the downswing. So I'm trying to stay a lot more in place, I guess you could say. So everything's mm. just getting toned down. That's kind of the best way to describe it. Yeah, it's interesting. I know um, we had touched on, you know, at at the speed that you you are capable of, your carry distances are are you know. I, I had made a joke about you know one sit one ninety five seven iron, and you're like, no, no, it's more like two twenty. Uh, yeah. you know, and then I'm like, God, it's like, dude, then that means, you know, your, your shortest stock yardage, so to speak is, it's probably like what, 140. So like being able to like your, your, your touch game really where for most people probably is like, you know, 40 to maybe a hundred yards, you have like right. an, an additional 50% to try to, to try to, 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 to deal with what, I mean, what is that? you know, how, I mean, how do you, how are you practicing that? What type of systems are you developing as someone who has to like consider maybe like a 130 yard shot, a like feel shot rather than a stock yardage? Yeah. That's, that's really funny you say that. So there's, I guess there's like two main things. One of them's equipment. So for a little while there, I was doing like the Bryson, you know, thousand under the number of the iron is optimal. So like mm. if I'm hitting a seven iron, the spin rate, you know, under this thought process is 6,000 RPM 6, is a qual is a quality seven iron that works really well, like on a launch monitor. And when I'm looking at the ball, like it looks really good, but it means my nine iron was almost going 200 yards. So mm. like it becomes a, this thing that I've done is I think eight iron and below for someone like me, those irons shouldn't be launching and spinning at optimal ball flight numbers. Like I think, I want a very soft nine iron and a very soft eight iron. So I've got, I now have a pitching wedge that's 48 degrees. So it's like an old school yeah, pitching wow. wedge. Yeah. It goes that's like cool. 160, which I, you know, if I hit it hard, which is wonderful, mm -hmm. 
um, the vast majority of my game is driver and then like 150 and in. It's like there mm. there very rarely is a par four or five where I'm hitting something from 200 yards plus. It's, it just doesn't happen that often. Um, so one of them is just equipment, just realizing or at least trying to figure out, is this a good idea to kind of go super soft in the pitching wedge nine iron and maybe even eight iron so that I have you know, five, six clubs under 200 yards instead of like three. So that those feel shots are now like interspersed with like a 61 degree wedge, a 56 and a half degree wedge, a 52 degree, and then the 48. So I've got like these, this build out of lower end stuff that helps me with that. And then the second thing is like, I don't want to say it's stack and tilt, but it really feels like that to me uh, to go back to what we just said. I just move it around a lot less. I'm trying to keep things from from collapsing so i'm not trying to lag a club i'm not trying to let the club get close to me on the downswing i'm trying to like feel like steve stricker um and like i don't move my pressure around i don't move my hands around it's just kind of like this simple chipping motion and so that's that's the goal like it's good sometimes but i still struggle because i don't get to practice enough so it still feels very foreign um mm. The, the best club in my bag is still the driver when I just go back and swing it like basically like a long driver because it's the most mm. most thing I uh, the biggest thing I've practiced and the most comfortable I am so it's still a struggle yeah I I was thinking about what when you're kind of explaining that that it I almost feel like it must be harder um to I mean you're used to a certain amount of stretch and load into the system and then and that's what your body then has kind of attuned itself to be like, okay, we load and then fire. And now to essentially reduce everything, you still want to load the system. So right. you have to keep everything tighter, but you don't want to load it as into like as greater ranges. Um, and you know, the, the live you did with Matt Yun and then his buddy JT Thomas, I think they, they always are talking about like kind of the fascial system and loading your swings yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. And, and, uh, from what I know in my, in my background, it's like, that's, that's really fascinating. I almost feel like it would be way harder because it's easy to feel a stretch sensation. If your hands are way up, you know, you can really yeah. feel it versus how do I feel a stretch when I'm within my normal range of motion, you still yeah. have to have some tension and then, figure out a way to, to kind of tension it a little bit to still, um, you know, produce a swing. Yeah. The same feels like the same tempo rhythm, all right. that stuff. Yeah. Um, it makes me appreciate and like understand maybe why Bryson likes that feeling of like end range, like why he likes to do a lot of those weird, like internal shoulder, external. Yeah. External wrist. supinated wrist. Yeah. Right. And so like, I, I can kind of understand that the, the only way I would describe it now is like the, the feeling of gaining tension is the same through like the, the big segments of the body, the shoulder, the hips, the thoracic spine, like the trunk, but then like the wrist, the elbows, like the hands don't get the same loaded feeling. Mm -hmm. So like I'm trying to get some of it and then take some of it away. So there's still some like normalcy to, to it, but it is, it is a challenge. And this is where like the thing to me is like, there is no swing that's going to make you a great golfer. Like, at the end of the day, you just have to practice and get a hang of whatever it is you're doing because it's always going to be, there's always room for error and issues somewhere. Sure. Um, it's, it's funny cause in, I I'm seeing a lot of this fascial stuff kind of coming into the forefront of golf instruction. But I mean, I, uh, I, in my field, you know, the, anatomy trains book has been it was, what, like 2000? It was 2008 or something was published. It was eight, it's yeah. like, it's not new at new all theories or anything like that. So it's kind of fun to see it kind of uh, trickle into this industry. Um, and I know that there's even, I'm sure you probably have a, a better grasp of this. There's a lot of um, like athletic training systems built around like training these um, yeah. fascial lines. So that kind of leads us into what would have been our, or what was our, um, next question of like, what kind of style of, of training then and, and fitness, um, do you think benefits, you know, golf? Yeah. Uh, okay. So last time it was like, what, what's, yeah, you kind of said that and it was a loaded question. I was like, well, to, to a degree it's, it's a loaded, like it's a difficult one to answer, but it's also sort of easy. So like it's difficult because there is no one way, like for me versus you versus my dad, like our training histories, our medical histories, 
what we're capable of is all different. So like the principles may be the same, like everyone should lift weights or do resistance training. So resistance training for my dad could be um, body weight squats, you know, inverted rows where he's just sort of on an incline. Whereas for you, it might be dumbbell rows and split stance work with weights. And for me, it might be front squats and hang cleans. And well, how, like, how many sets, how many sets and reps do I need to do? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Like they're all resistance training. We're all trying to get stronger, yeah. but we're all meeting ourselves at wherever it is we're at. So it's like resistance training is a, is a key. Everyone should do it. You should do it through as full a range of motion as you can without pain. So as long as you're cleared to do it, you should ideally move through a full range of motion because that is mobility work. Like we said last time, mm. um, everyone should do some form of power work. Golf is a speed power sport at this point. Um, that's like, there is no denying that at this point to swing a golf club as fast as you can is like a highly ballistic activity. So if you can jump, you can jump like that's great. Throwing med balls is great. Um, you can just lift weights like with, with a maximum intent to lift the weight quickly. So like if you can't jump and land and like your knees don't accept that, or you've got something wrong in your feet, you may just find a way to do some weight training. That's fast. Mm -hmm. Um, swinging golf clubs fast is not like, if you're not hitting golf balls is in, in a sense training. So it's like speed and power strength training. If you have time, the, the cardiovascular work is actually quite good. So like heart rates between 110, 130 beats a minute for extended periods of time is very low intensity. Uh, it's more restorative in nature. It's good for the auto, auto the autonomic system. So parasympathetic, sympathetic tone. Um, and it will play like a big role in like your general life wellness. So it'll, it'll help your training, but it's just a good thing to do. And then mobility stuff. Like if you have time to do cardiovascular work and sort of like yoga ish mobility, great. But it's like resistance training first. If you can power training, if you've got more time, do the aerobic work. If you've got more time, do the mobility. But like the the levels are important because if you're strapped for time, you've got to you've got to get stronger. Like it's easily the biggest, like lowest hanging fruit people have. Well, and I think, Tyler. I think w one of the things that we had said last time too, that you had pointed out was that like, you can, you can accomplish a lot of those things with, with like one thing. So specifically going back to the mobility aspect of it, you had mentioned, it's very important to go full range of motion. Well, in a lot yeah. of cases, that is a way to, to work on your mobility as well. If you're going full depth on a squat, like that's, that's, yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're doing great yeah. things for your hips. Like you're doing great things for the the adductors, the glutes, like loaded, loaded activity is actually like very beneficial for muscle length. Now, if you do it like old school bodybuilders and like lift to failure, do burnout sets, um, like assisted reps, like that will make you more prone to feeling tight because you'll get mm. sore. The more sore you get, like there's going to be novelty and soreness. So like the first time you do a new activity, you'll get sore. That's fine. But if you're doing things consistently of like very high weights and very high degrees of failure, you'll tend to build some like muscular tone and tension. So like there is some stuff you don't want to do all the time, mm -hmm. but in general, like really well, like just good planned resistance trainings, like easily the best thing you can do for yourself by far. Yeah. Since we last spoke, Tyler has become a, an expert in the WEC method. In the oh, shoulder. man. Dude, the well, I, I've yeah. got he such got bad shoulders. So yeah. someone, uh, uh, someone was like, um, yeah, dude, have you ever heard of Indian clubs? I was like, no, I don't know what that is. And so I got some, and then I just do like this basic, like five minute routine every day for like, you know, and, and like my shoulders have never, like literally never felt better uh, since yeah. I was probably a, like a child. Um, right. and then they're like, Hey dude, if you want to step it up, check out the RMT club from WEC. So I was <laughs> yeah. like, Whoa, that looks neat. So I got that yeah. too. So I've been, I've been messing around with that, um, as like a way of, of kind of more of like the explosive training that you had mentioned, you know, more power stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I've, I've been, I've been digging it. It's, it's been interesting. Yeah. And some of the cool stuff about the, like the Indian clubs is just like getting the shoulders and stuff to move is like pumping blood through the joints. 
getting yeah. synovial fluid moving, like just moving around under load is a good thing. So it's like people don't realize the benefits can be so simple, but so like widespread that it's kind of ridiculous. Well, and especially with the mm-hmm. Indian clubs, I, I was surprised because I, I, you know, I got the two pound, the two pound yeah. Indian club and I was like, there's yeah. no way, there's no way that this is going to be beneficial for me or that I'm even going to feel it. And after like, you know, I, I try to do like 20 reps of each movement and then move on to the other one. You know, like the first time I did it, like by 10, I was like, oh my gosh, this is burning pretty good. <laughs> like two yeah. pounds, you know, when you get two pounds, like all, all the way extended out, um, you know, concentrated in the head of that club. It's like, yeah, you, you kind of feel that. Yeah. Surprising. Hey, I've got, yeah, I've got the two pounders just back over in the gym over there. Yeah. I thought the same thing when I bought like a five pound mace bell. I was like, yeah, oh, that, that'll be, that'll be a nice starting Easy. point. Like, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. But yeah, yeah. so we, we do the same things with our guys in our next year group. Like we do these things we call general strength circuits. And it's essentially mm-hmm. like if, if you can imagine, so it's called a pillar series, uh, pillar. Yeah. Pillar pedestal, pedestal series. So it's an old track and field thing. Um, but imagine holding like a front plank, front plank on hands, uh, supine plank, supine plank on hands. And if you try and hold yourself with your, with your arms behind you, so elbows or shoulders extended, forearms on the ground, butt off the ground, like just hold that for a few seconds. And you start to realize, A, like when was the last time we, we put ourselves under tension with extended shoulders? It's like never. Grab Most walk, of the guys in the group fourth can't thing. even hold the position. Like they can't even get themselves there with their butt up. And so it becomes this like, okay, now we're going to hold on the side. So people look at it like it's a plank, but really it's like a massive upper body shoulder. Uh, I don't know what you want to call it, a chest opener, but basically just loading the shoulder through a whole bunch of range. And everyone's like, oh man, I feel really good after mm-hmm. that. And you're like, yeah, you just, you just sent blood and tension through an area. You've probably been sitting like this for the past two decades. Yeah. And it felt pretty good. Well, that reminds me of something else that you had mentioned, uh, in our last conversation, <clears throat> I think we'd asked you about, you know, what are, what are some things, and actually this will probably lead into our next question, but it's like, what are some things that people get wrong or, or maybe put too much emphasis on? Um, and you know, one of the things that I had said is I, I feel like, you know, everyone tells you how tight your hips are and you got to loosen up your hips for golf. And you said that, that there's probably a different part of your body that is it, that's too tight that you need to develop mobility in that would, that would actually be more beneficial from a golf perspective. Um, would you, do you, do you want to maybe get into that a little bit? Maybe if, if you know what I'm, if I'm, yeah. What I'm referring yeah. So to. for me, like when you look at a golfer's mobility and what moves through a huge range of motion, it's typically the shoulder, like the scapular thoracic joint, and then like the glenohumeral joint. So the, the shoulder blades moving across this, the, the back. Um, if you can imagine, like this is my, my shoulder blades on the back of my body. They need to upwardly rotate. They need to like a uh, protract and retract. Um, so they, they have a bunch of like shoulder blade movement and then the, the shoulder needs to internally and externally rotate. It needs to flex and extend like the shoulders and neck and thoracic spine move so much in comparison to the, the hips. Now, I don't think any of us would say the hips like don't matter, right. but if it were, Again, like a choice on time, I would spend the time up top well before I would spend the time at the hips. Now, again, for general like life and lifting weights, the hips are, are vitally important and they're important to golf. But for swinging a golf club fast, being able to move the, the arms, um, what is it, the golfing machine? It's like the yeah. power accumulator number whatever. <laughs> uh, is it the second, the second accumulator? So it, Probably. They, they attribute a ton of speed to this, this lead shoulder uh, adducting across the body, getting turned into, and then flinging off the chest. Um, so yeah, shoulders, scaps. And then like, if you, if we can consider basically from like your belly button to your neck, a joint Mm -hmm. instead of like 12, (laughs) just consider like the way all of those move together is like, that's where I would do my, my work kind of chin to belly button basically. Yeah, and I think yeah. I made this point last time that like the the actual amount of range of motion necessary to make a good golf swing in the hips is a lot less than than people think it is. And there's also some some uh, 
a lot of times a little bit of a misleading rhetoric, I guess, because there's the hip joint and then we see pelvis rotation. And a lot of times people are like, I want to open my hips and fire my hips. And they're talking about their pelvis opening. The yeah. hip joint itself is actually internally rotating, if if I'm not mistaken, or should be, I guess, on the lead side. But um, so like the those ranges of motion are, it's not like something somewhere where you would need to strive for more mobility, not like the thoracic spine anyway. Right. Right. And I think you're getting to the point, like the pelvis, like it's not like my, my hip joint is moving. It's the pelvis rotating on top of a fixed femur. So they, yeah. they call it, what is it? AFIR. So it's like mm -hmm. fast tabular femoral internal rotation onto the lead side. And then to the point of like not needing a bunch of uh, mobility, like if you don't have that much, the foot is allowed to Jordan Spieth peel to the heel or rainbow and like come off the ground. Like those things are allowed in golf. Like you, you don't get punished for having a foot that moves around like Scotty Scheffler. So like you can't do that in the upper body, like move around stuff, but you can at the feet. So like you can let mm. the feet kind of squirrel around and move around them. So like in, in all reality, you probably don't need all that much range of motion at all. Really. On the, on the, the, along the lines of kind of misconceptions, um, because obviously I think that, I mean, that right there is something that pe people probably haven't really thought of. Um, but going more back to speed, because as you said, and it's no secret, speed is king. Um, speed is, is, uh, what's taking over the pro game, elite amateur game, obviously. Um, when we're seeing, you know, guys like Nick Dunlap come out and win tour events and that guy hits at a pretty, pretty long way. Um, yeah. What, uh, what misconceptions do you think the average golfer, you know, your average, like kind of weekend warrior, 14 handicap kind of guy, um, <clears throat> has about speed or, or what it takes to generate speed or, you know, where, where speed comes from, whether it be from, you know, misconceptions by golf digest and, you know, golf magazine or, or, you know, things we are seeing on YouTube or Instagram. Um, you know, what, what would you say to, to that person? in regards to what they may believe about speed that might not actually be true. Yeah. Well, I'd start like, usually the conversation starts with like, if you're somebody who argues that speed is important and like putting is golf and like, you know, uh, I, how many comments have I gotten? Like, well, Dustin Johnson three putted the, the 18th green at the, the U S open and lost. And so if you're one of those people, like speed doesn't make you a good golfer, but it's becoming the foundation at which like good, great golf is built off of. So like everybody on tour is faster than your, your average amateur. And there's a mm -hmm. reason for that. It's like everybody in the NBA is taller than your average person, but being tall doesn't make you good at, at basketball. It's just like a, it's becoming like a foundational prerequisite. So like, mm -hmm. we're not saying like, if you're not fast, you can't play good golf. It's that saying if you're faster, like your, your bare minimum starts like raising, like you're raising the, the floor. And then there's always going to be a ceiling that's filled in with like accuracy and consistency and putting and chipping and blah, blah, blah. But like the, the floor is your speed. So like if mm. you lift your speed, you kind of lift your floor. The misconceptions to me are still people try and like single down speed to like this one thing. It's like some people I've heard like, well, most of the speed comes from the wrists. And it's like, okay, that's an interesting thing. And people will be like, well, if you, if you get on the knees, you can still see guys like I hit a ball 180 off my knees. Martin hit one two, 200 something off his knees. And so they're like, obviously the legs don't play a role. And it's like, okay, well, this is really, it's a bad way to look at things because the knees, the pelvis, the abdominals, the rib cage, like all of that stuff is still at play. Um, yeah. So the first thing with speed is, is like the summation of things is the most important. So the, the sequence and the summation of forces and velocities, so transferring velocity from the pelvis to the thorax, thorax to the arms, arms to the wrist, wrist to the club, like that chain, that's like your holy grail of speed. Don't think like arms generate speed or, or the ground force is what generates speed. It, it all does. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not effort driven, it's, it's sequence driven. So the cleaner, um, the more efficient, if you will, the sequence, the easier speed becomes to attain. So like to me, and I think I'm probably heavily influenced from Dana, Dana Dahlquist and Josh Koch. Yeah. But if you ever saw their hit bombs program, uh, it's basically like just sequence work on the golf swing 
for like weeks until they ever talk about speed training, like the stack or super speed or whatever. And it's because like that foundation of like a quality golf swing, I guess a, a quality golf sequence is like by far and away the single biggest contributor to speed out there without question. Um, then yeah, you stack, like, say it again. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to yeah. say you stack something like a proper sequence on then like an athletic body. So like, okay, like we've seen NFL guys who are physical specimens hit the ball nowhere. Mm -hmm. And we've seen like Michelle Wee in Hawaii when she was like 12 smash golf balls. So yeah. people start going, well, okay, well the gym doesn't matter because like take those two examples. And it's like, well, okay, just, just wait a second because if I go to a long drive event, I don't see any Michelle Wee's anywhere. And there's a okay. reason for that because again, like we're talking about baseline capabilities. So like the bigger, the stronger you are, the more potential you're going to have for speed. If you put Tiger Woods 2000 golf swing on LeBron, you know, peak athleticism body, that swing is going to be faster than if it was Michelle Wee. Like it's, there's no way a six foot seven beautiful golf swing that can jump out of the gym doesn't produce a fast golf swing. Yeah. So it's like this, these misnomers I think are more foundational than like, oh, I'm going to do speed work, um, you know, three days a week instead of four days a week. I think people just get the wrong idea that speed is like this, this one thing with the arms, or if I do this one move, like speed's going to jump. And it's like, it might, but like the, the secret to speed is like the whole picture. Like that's, that's where like, I think when people get sort of obsessed with what I do and why the speed looks kind of easy and you just start like checking things off, like the kinetic sequence I have is good. Like not only is it good, but my force traces are very clean. There's no jaggedness in like the outputs. The kinematic sequence is good. I'm 6'4", 230, you know, like I basically just start stacking all these things. And it's like, of course, like I've got the ability to hit the ball far. Like it's, I didn't mm -hmm. do speed work four days a week and I still hit it far. When yeah. I do speed work, I just kind of start swinging a little faster. It's, it's always like, look at the whole, to me, that's, that's the missed part. Like, look at the whole thing. So yeah, it's almost like, to... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, <laughs> like, so it's almost like that. Um, it's not just like speed. It, it's speed at the right time. It's speed, uh, in, in, in the, you know, for, uh, from a seat, well, sequencing. I mean, you said that, but just from like right. a, 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 you know, a, a, a range of time, like the the speed or the force being being maximized at the right time. Because it's like, yeah, if you have, um, you know, a, 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 a Bosa, Nick Bosa out there swinging a club, I'm sure he has the capability of generating some insane speed. But if he doesn't do it at the right spot, it's not translating to ball speed because he's probably lost all of his speed out here. And if you right. do that, there's no way that you can regain it coming through. So, um, I, I think that's very interesting because I think so many of us, myself included, it's like, man, all right, I, I just, I gotta, I gotta learn to swing faster. I gotta learn to put more effort into my swings and like swing with intent to be swing faster, you know, get, you know, get stronger. Mm -hmm fast twitch muscles, like all of these like hype keyword, you know, uh, that I've heard all over the internet, but it's like, dude, if you're not swinging, if that's not all happening at the right time, doesn't, unfortunately it kind of doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. It's like, that's, I was going to say, it's like, it's like the people, what people get wrong is they are asking like what part of the whip is most important to creating a, you right. know, a whiplash? It's like, well, all of it, you, you all can't, it. you can't lose a section of it or, or bolster a section of it and make it work better. It's, it's, um, you know, it's a, each, each thing has its incremental piece. And I think that's Tyler, you just said something that we talked about last time. And I think Drew brought this up as, as kind of your, your answer to this question originally was that like people get wrong is that the effort equals um, speed more speed um, yeah. uh, and and I, I I liked that that idea a lot because it's you know it's not that I'm working really hard it's that I'm working in, in the right sequence at the right time yeah and so like yeah the, the thing I said last time was like when and when you feel effort when most people most people feel effort it's going to be the thing closest to the part holding the club 
Mm. So like if I want to move this fast, I tend to move the things up top very hard and very early. So like we lose all of that linkage, all the, all the stuff where you were talking about with the fascial system and all of the slings and all that stuff starts going out the window. When I get up top and I let the top of the sling out first, it's like if I had a rubber band stretched and then I was like, all right, I'm going to shoot this. I'm going to move this back and then let it go. It's like mm. you just you just spent everything, all that tension, you just yanked out of the system and now you're going to try and go again. Um, it's like that old saying, what is it? The, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's like yeah. mm -hmm. you can't pick apart one little thing and be like, oh, I'm just going to work my legs today because ground force matters. And it's like, well, it only matters if you then take it to the pelvis and the pelvis up. Cause like we see with the LPGA players, they've got some of the fastest hip speeds out there, but they can't get it to the club because they lack some stuff, probably some strength in the, the torso, probably quite a bit of strength in the shoulder girdle and hands to get everything out to the golf club. So it's like, it's never one thing. Like don't ever, unless you have like a glaring issue where like you get up to the top of your swing and you just throw your arms down and you're like, okay, I'm going to focus on like, getting my legs and hips to go like maybe that gets you into a better sequence maybe but to like say it from the outset like all oh, the hips are the the king of swing speed it's like maybe like maybe for some people you know and that's I how know, i feel like these systems all like garner attention is like it's right for somebody because right. that's their missing their missing link in the chain and so they're like oh it worked for me it's gotta be good. Yeah. It's gotta be and it's good. Like, have, you, have you talked to fast Eddie or have you seen Eddie Fernandez? I've seen it. Cause yeah. Eddie, Eddie has a lot of feels that like pulling the club down gets mm. him to go faster. Cause it makes his ground interaction better. And it's like, bro, if I did that, I would be terrible. All of my feels mm. are feet, pelvis and like pressure oriented, but he's faster than I am. So like something's happening that's beneficial, but like, talking about individual feels or like this worked for me is really difficult. It's really difficult to spread it across everyone. Mm -hmm. I think um, something, I can't remember if we talked about this last time or not. I feel like we must have, but like the, um, the sequence itself, we tend to see it a lot in like little kids or even in other, other, I would say sports like, um, like, lumberjack game type things where they're oh, yeah. you know chopping wood and things like that where like so the we can see it in these other walks of life that's like oh there's the perfect golf sequence right there and right. i think it boils down to like okay intent is probably where we should start um because if the intention is to move something you know that way right your body naturally does a handful of things correct or correctly um so, um, versus intent versus like feels or, or, you know, positions or, you know, I don't know, key well, moves, I think it, secret moves. I, th I think Nathan, what you're, you're probably talking about is when we were, we were, when we were doing our hot take stuff. Um, oh yeah, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. So I no, I was saying, <laughs> I was saying that, that I think that elite golf, uh, is like, it, it happens in childhood because, or, or like, like, uh, like, I guess we'll say proper or like a, a, a naturally proper sequence is developed in childhood and, uh, and it's much harder to, to, to develop as an adult because when you're a kid, you have zero up, upper body strength. The only way that you can get that club to the ball is, is ground up fully rotational. That's the only way you can move the club because you don't have the upper body strength to overcome the inertia of the club head. Um, that's whipping around you. Now take me who took, took up the game when I was 17 years old, I had plenty of upper body strength. And so I've always had issues with that kind of like, you know, shallow tilts and all that stuff. Cause I didn't like, I didn't feel like I needed to do that to create yeah. speed. I drew, like you were saying, I was trying to create speed by moving my hands as quickly as possible. And that, that creates problems. And so like going back to the lumberjack or like trying to throw a sledgehammer that I can't over, right. you know, I'm not strong enough to overcome the inertia of that. Um, th that's where you start seeing like, not even thinking about it and the positions I get into when I'm trying to throw a, you know, an eight pound sledgehammer as far as I can down range. 
Um, that looks better than my golf swing it almost every single time. And I'm not even thinking about it because yeah. that's not my, my goal isn't positions. My goal is get it over there knowing that I can't, can't really force it. I kind of have right. to like allow it to happen. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, you guys see it in everything. So like you can even watch a shot putter and like, you'll see them do a lot of the same things you see long drivers do. They'll start to like, like get a little momentum going like the Kyle Berkshire walk, but they'll sort of like rock forward rock back and then start their spin because if they just start from a dead stop there's no energy in the system so like all of these things you see golfers like waggling back and forth to get something going like uh you see in a pitcher's wind up throwing the leg up and back and like all of these sports do the same things they just do it in the the context of their sport but i think you're right tyler like if we got everyone to go pick up like a 20 to 50 pound medicine ball and said, let's see how far you can throw it. Like all of a sudden, everybody's going to like pressure shift early. They're going to like throw the med ball forward, let it come back, shift forward and throw. And like all of the pressure stuff's going to clean up because it it has to. There is no choice to throw that thing unless you you do everything well, use your body well. Um, So you're right. I think kids have that advantage where it's like, oh God, this is is heavy. Like if I want to move it, I basically have to move it with my body and hold on for dear life with my arms. You yeah. can't just take it and like zing it with their hands and hands and arms. So it's a, it's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And to our point today, then it's more, that's just like the foundation. And then as you get stronger, then you uh, continue to move well, but then move faster. Yeah. yeah. Faster and you start adding, like if, if golf is the goal, you start adding things like structure to make it more easily repeatable. Um, if your goal is long drive and just maximum speed, you basically just keep it going and like make it a bit exaggerated. You just kind of keep trying to pump it more and more. So it's kind of like, that's where things start to diverge. I think that's like one of the things that was interesting with my little journey is that with Dana, like we just kind of got faster and then like around the 140 mile an hour club speed thing, things started to go Mm. in different directions. It was like, Oh, well long drive, we're going to do this. And, like for golf, we're going to do that. But like from 120 to 140, it was awesome. my golf got better. My swing speed got better. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, this is, these are no longer <laughs> things. So at a certain point, like this, the seat, the, I guess the sequencing probably, <laughs> or the way that you go about firing different things at different points, though, that those kind of forked at that point. But you're saying up till about 140 miles an hour, it's like, no, the sequencing was, was the same. And it's, you're just optimizing, you know, certain aspects you're stacking on that base level foundation, um, to, and then, then building from there. But then at a certain point you kind of had to make the decision like, Hey, do I want, like want to optimize even further or do I want to like be able to find a green? (laughs) Exactly. With a wedge yeah. and not put like yeah. very thin loss. But, but yeah, the biggest thing to point at is if you go back and look at old swings, like at around 140, it looked very much like a golf swing. And then beyond that, it started to get very much like up and across trail arm flying and trail arm collapsing uh, levels in my head. So like I would stand up, squat down, stand up type of thing. Um, all of that stuff just got more and more pronounced beyond 140. Mm. We're so, yeah. I mean, we pretty much, you know, I got a little ways to go. Tyler's pretty much there. <laughs> yeah, easily, dude. Right around the corner. <laughs> yeah. If you add up, yeah, the swing speed of my driver and like my pitching wedge, it's easily 140, dude. Like, not even. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it might be 150. <laughs> I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty quick. Um, I, I think we've kind of answered this question about, you know, what's the most effective vehicle for developing speed. I mean, I would say just, listening to you talk, um, you know, it's, it's develop, a, uh, uh, first and foremost, develop a sequence. Um, and I think as adults, um, we, when we were talking with, um, uh, Kim earlier today, you know, she had mentioned that, you know, Hey, if, if you're, if you're pressed for time and you really want to get better, like find a coach. So find yeah. someone that, and you've worked with Dana for quite a while. Um, it's like, Hey, find someone who can help you develop that sequence. Because if you don't have a good sequence, everything else you're going to, you're going to do is, is at the very like best, not going to be help. It's not going to help you optimize. And at the worst, you're probably just going to maybe potentially lead to like injury or, you know, develop even worse of a sequence. Um, yeah, but it's, it's like building on a bad foundation. 
Right. Mm. But then assuming you have that, then it's like, okay, strength training is probably number one. Um, and then you kind of work down that list of, you know, getting in towards like more, you know, the power work and then speed work and then, you know, into your mobility, depending on the amount of time that you have. Um, but it all really, it seems like it kind of goes back to, and if you don't have a good golf swing (laughs) from a sequencing standpoint, you're cooked. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You just, you just put a cap on yourself. It's like putting a governor on a golf cart. Like you just like hamper your ability so much that it's, it's unbelievably difficult to overcome. Now you can, like we see people out there with really goofy golf swings, swinging fast, but most, well, I would, I would probably say none of them can play like high quality golf. Yeah. You know, Mm. you've got ridiculous engines and they, they swing fast, but the ball's going every which direction or like high and low contacts bad. So it's like, it's like a thing of goals. Like if you actually want to be able to play at all, you've got to have like a, at least a decently good golf swing, in my opinion. Mm. I don't, I don't know how to organically get here. I don't remember what line of, of questioning we got to get to this, but this was something that you said was really interesting um, that I, I wanted to make sure we covered again. Um, and I guess maybe it goes a little bit back to the idea of like, um, you know, maintaining a certain baseline to prevent injury. Um, but understanding like the, Oh, I now remember it's understanding like your capabilities as a, as a person, um, like your physical capabilities. It's like, Hey, I would love to be able to swing the club like, um, Dustin Johnson does or Waco Neiman or whoever, but I also can't move the way that those guys move. So there's a potential for, for injury there. If I'm pushing myself too hard, um, and not understanding the limitations that I have because I'm not a professional athlete, I don't have the time necessary to dedicate to all of those things that you had mentioned, um, previously, but, um, this is a very long winded way of saying that you kind of had a hot take on, on pro golf as a whole, like, uh, um, with, with the direction that it's going with speed being so, uh, important, what, uh, from a future of professional golf standpoint, what is your opinion on the longevity or kind of like peak, uh, playing, uh, range for professional golfers moving into, you know, maybe the next decade or so. Yeah. I think golf is going to move like basically every other speed power sport to be a younger, shorter lifespan sport at the elite level. Like Mm -hmm. there's a big difference between stepping in the, the ropes at the masters versus like playing with your buddies on Sunday. Like it's, there's a huge difference between playing 530 yard par fours regularly Mm -hmm. and having to, to score on those holes regularly versus playing the, you know, the 350 yard par four that we get to go have fun on. So in my opinion, golf's going to be sort of like all the other sports, tennis, (laughs) football, um, pitching, you're going to see people move faster and faster and faster. Their body positions are going to get more and more extreme in order to deliver the club consistently at these high speeds. So you're going to see things like pitchers who, if you ever see a pitcher, their arm is laid back like 180 degrees. Like that stuff is not bad, but it's not manageable for a long period of time. So mm. people, I think, are going to start blaming these golf swings and say, hey, like so-and-so got hurt. Will Zalatoris hurt his back. Yeah. Obviously, he's doing something wrong. And you're like, well – was he doing something wrong or was he like one of the most prolific ball strikers we've seen in a while? And like, that's where things are going. Cause you can start looking at some of the best ball strikers um, in Neiman. I mean, we could go back to Garcia, to DJ Hovland. Um, and you start I mean, seeing a lot of like very Dunlap. similar. Dunlap, most recently, yeah. I mean, All if you look them. at Dunlap at, 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 at impact, I was like, man, I, it happens quickly. So you don't necessarily <laughs> see it. Um, and, and I don't, maybe it's like, we've become a little bit desensitized to it. I think the first time I ever saw Neiman swing, I was like, oh my God, what is that? <laughs> but then I didn't really even notice it when I was watching Dunlap, but then I saw some stills of him. I'm like, he's, he's damn near parallel hey, hey. Yeah. at impact. Well, yeah. I mean, and it's, it's really like through the ball. Like as he goes from impact to like lead arm or trail arm parallel, it's almost like he continues into side bend 
um, and, and hip extension. So it's like these positions are going to continue that way because people are finding beneficial results that way. So it's not like we can't be the, the armchair expert and say, well, back in Jack's day, like guys used to play like this and you're like, they did. And now all of those records are getting broken. Like yeah. people are playing better golf. Um, we know more about the golf swing. We know more about speed and power and fitness. Like people are going to push levels more and more and more because you have to, if you want to be successful. Um, you know, I feel, you got baseball, if you're throwing 105 mile an hour fastballs, like those arms don't last like they used to. They aren't pitching complete games. Like um, tennis players, their knees are getting blown up, their shoulders, their elbows. They don't last as long. Like it's, it's just sort of an evolution of sport that's going to, that's going to take place. Um, now the problem with that is if you're my dad and you watch Neiman or Dunlap and you're like, I really like the way that guy swings. I'm going to go do that. And you're like, okay, do me a favor, touch your toes. And he's like <laughs> touching his kneecaps. And you're like, okay, let's like take a step back and now try and do that at like the fastest possible velocity you can. Let's see how that feels. So yeah. it's like, it's really, it's an interesting place for golf because so much of golf gets influenced by the professional game, equipment, swings, styles, um, that the, the average amateur I think is going to have less and less relatability to the tour pro from a learning standpoint, from an equipment standpoint, from a playing standpoint. So it's going to be an interesting thing. Cause it's like, when do you turn on an NBA game and be like, Oh, I should go do that. It's like, I know I, I can't do what they do. Like it's not even close. And I think golf's going to move in that direction. Yeah. Um, I think if we were, if, if we were paying attention back, you know, early two thousands or even late nineties, I mean, Tiger was, it's pretty easy to draw a line with Tiger in in like old golf, new golf, kind of if you want to. Um, like before him, the careers were 20, 30 year long careers on tour and guys they didn't were so really long. Hurt. They were so yeah. long, they had to create a separate <laughs> league for champ. They had to create the Champions Tour because their careers were so long. Yeah. They're like, you know what? We got to give them something to do at 50 yeah. because they've got more in the tank. And it's They're like, still going. like could you imagine Waco so Neiman on the champions tour? They'd have to, no. they'd have to move that to 35. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's just going to be interesting. Cause you're obviously going to have guys like DJ may last forever. Like Phil yeah. Nicholson may last forever. Like there's, there's going to be people to do it. I think, like if you like Tom Brady played forever in the NFL, but the average NFL career is like three years two years. It's like hyper short, but we're always going to pick people. And I think that's like the danger of like all this stuff, speed training, you know, we'll listen to whoever Borgmeier who swings the fastest or Berkshire. And it's like, well, they said X. So that's got to be what I do. Mm. And it's like, it just gets really difficult to, to take these one-off examples. Again, Martin, Kyle, I think I'm trying to think Justin James, Josh, they all are like physically really impressive. If you've seen them in person, like they're big, they're mobile, they're explosive, they're strong. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's hard to copy those people unless you've got all those things going for you. Yeah. I just watch a lot of Jamie Sedlowski. He's shorter like me. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's right. short, but he's a freak. He, right? you see he's, he's amazing. 550 pounds, right? Yeah. He's, oh, he's huge. crazy strong. He's yeah. insanely so it's strong. Like, it's, it's all, it's all funny. Because it is like, we'll point at Tiger and be like, well, his knee was blown up because of what he did with his, like the lead leg extension. And you're like, maybe, maybe it was a Navy SEAL crap he did. And like all the yeah, running. It might, and, it might've yeah. been the 10 miles a morning. Could have been yeah, that, that too. That probably wasn't smart. Um, we can't yeah, ever so know for certain what Tiger was doing with those pleated pants back then. I mean, they were just <laughs> balloons. Like true. this is yeah, billowous. <laughs> yeah, we don't know what was happening was camouflaged there. For sure. We don't know what was going on under there. That's a good point. Uh, but yeah, I think golf. I think golf suffers from that, like picking out these little, like one-off examples and trying to make a a point with them, rather than looking at like the entirety of the tour or like the entirety of college golf and being like, "Wow, there's like eighty percent of these guys side bending like wild." That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Like let's let's not pick the one guy that got hurt and say, "Well, obviously it was side bending was bad." It's like. I don't know. It seems like it's a, a thing for a reason. I don't think he's doing it yeah. because it's bad. 
Yeah. I think, I guy. think though too, it's like under, I think more and more people, this is the idea of like, everything's not for you. It's like, Hey man. Right. And I've, I've, I've learned this as I've gotten older that it's like, Hey, like I have to accept that I can't do, there's just things that I can't do. I just can't do it. And so like asking, like me going to my coach and saying like, Hey, I want to be able to do X, Y, Z, but here are some things I know that I cannot do. So let's figure out a way to work around that so that I can try to get as close to this as possible, but also like be able to walk tomorrow. Um, right. and, and like, I think more people, um, you know, to your point saying like, it's, it's not a great idea to look at, at, at a certain, like one data point and say, and, and then draw conclusions from that. I think, you know, like just still images or, or two dimensional videos of swings is actually really detrimental to, yeah, to your understanding because it's like, you look at a position you're like, cool, I'm going to get there. But it's like, you know, there, there was a whole, like there, there's a whole, like one and a half second period of movement that yep. got them there. And like, if you don't know how any of that worked, then like just recreating that and then being like, all right, I'm going to try to get back there and yeah. manufacturing that. It's like, you're, you're, you're not, it's never going to happen. You're more, you're more than likely just going to hurt yourself. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I, I think, I think it's a really interesting take that it's like, Hey, you know, the idea of, uh, of, you know, a, another guy like Phil, Mi Phil Mickelson winning a major at 50 years old, uh, it's 51 is yeah. probably not, probably not in the cards, uh, right. moving forward. Yeah, that's a freak. Like, like LeBron, LeBron's a good example in the NBA guys like never really been hurt. He's played forever. He's played tons of minutes. And like, if you can explain to me how he never got hurt and Kobe got hurt, like every play he was on the court, like I'll listen, but I don't think anyone knows. It's just sort of luck, genetics, yeah. like Kobe and LeBron aren't training. Like LeBron's training isn't so sophisticated that that's what saved him. There's, there's a host of like genetic and luck factors in there. So like, you never know what's going to come around. But the chances, the odds are getting smaller and smaller, in my opinion, that that's going to happen again. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. Um, well, I think the last question we had was um, it, it, the last question that we ask everyone is, um, hey, if you had six hours a week to practice, um, what would you focus on? I think uh, in it, like leaning it more into your expertise, you know, what uh G getting more into that foundation, um, you know, what, from a, from a training standpoint outside, uh, you know, off the golf course in the gym, um, where, where are, and, and you may have answered this a little bit already, but it's like, Hey, if I have an hour a day at the gym, what should I be focusing on in, in uh, with, with the intent, uh, with my intent being, I want to get better at golf. I'd like to swing the club a little faster. I'd like to have better stamina out there. I like, I want to play better golf. I don't want to just hit the ball farther, but I want to play better golf overall. How would you, you know, approach a client and be like, Hey, generally this is how I think you should spend your one hour a day in the gym. Yeah. Okay. So if, if now, if you're giving me full control, I would take a half hour from Tuesday and Thursday and give it to Monday and Friday. So I'd have, Oh, or actually, take like Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and give some of that time to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I'd have three hour and a half long sessions that are like proper warm up, power, weight training days. So okay. like you really like take your you do it you do it well. <clears throat> proper warm up where you're sweating um, before you start your training. You get in and you do like ideally. Again, it's hard for me to say this. If you're healthy enough to sustain like jumping, you do something powerful to start each one of those days. And then you do like basic lifting. So you would go, you know, like if you want to follow an old protocol, there's like a, um, a heavy light medium. So you kind of go like big lifts on Monday, light, like body weight, single leg, single limb, uh, single cables on, on Wednesday. And then like a medium day on, on Friday, sort of like this wave undulating type of thing. Mm. So that's like a simple one to go to. And like, that's how I would do it. I would go kind of like big lifts on Monday. Um, preferably you've played your golf Saturday, Sunday, and like you've got all week. So you can kind of get after it on Monday. Yeah. Um, Tuesday, I would say 
Like if you're your golfer, do your mobility work, go home or go to the gym for 30 minutes and do either a, what you like, or go through these general strike circuits that we have, um, at next year. Like there, you can look them up. I think on YouTube, I think there's pedestal pillar. Um, God, I'm going to forget the names Waterloo. There's, there's these exercises that are old track and field stuff, Mm. but it's essentially just putting your body through range of motion, uh, moving the extremities in sort of like, I would call them weird positions because Mm. they're just not normal for most people. Um, but it gets you out of like the desk posture, the, the, the forward, forward shoulders, um, rounded back, and it gets you out into something new. So that would be my Tuesday, Thursday, um, Wednesday, again, be the light day again, split stance work. No, you don't even need to do power work. You can do med ball slams or something for the arms if you want. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, uh, split squats, single arm rows, uh, you could do inverted TRX rows, Mm push-ups, handstand push-ups, um, feet elevated push-ups, dips, body weight, body weight related things. Thursday, again, general strength and or like yoga ish mobility. Um, Friday, you're looking at things that are like challenging front squats, RDLs, but like mid rep ranges, eight, eight to 12 reps. Um, looking, it's almost like a bodybuilding type of day. You're really like developing muscles. Gotcha. Moving through a full range of and doing, say it again? Hypertrophy type stuff almost. Exactly. So it's like heavy light and then hypertrophy basically um saturday sunday again now if you're going to play golf saturday sunday maybe the hypertrophy day gets pushed a day forward on thursday Mm. so that you have friday to do your mobility stuff relax and then do your golf um if you've got those the same hours on your golf days i would just give it to your golf and just go to the go to the range go to the short game area and take that hour and just put it into your golf and then just have the week as your, your, your body work. And then the weekend can be like specifically golf, enjoy it. Um, yeah. you want to do something that you can maintain and enjoy doing more than the thing that's correct that you hate doing. So yeah. for me, like when I, when I have time, I would much rather go to a golf course, like a nice golf course and just hang out. Like that to me is a, a lot of fun. So I like to free up my time if I can. That reminds me of one thing, one, one last thing that you had said uh, last last time we talked was um, uh, uh, is is showing up and being available. Um, the best, uh, yeah, the God, best ability it? is availability. The best ability is availability. So it, you know, and going back to the thing that you said <coughs> very early on in just this conversation about being about soreness, right? Like um, yeah. that it's like, man, if if you're if you're constantly sore, if if you're creating your own barrier to continue being consistent by you won't yeah by either training too hard or like forcing yourself to do things that you hate you're not yeah. going to do it and so it's like it's better to do like like the not optimal thing um that you enjoy that you'll keep coming back to than it is to like have the most optimized uh you know regiment for, you know that's down to the minute but you hate every second of it um 100%. the chances of you yep. following through that are so much less yep it's the same thing like with any psychology and dieting. If you're like, I can't have carbs because evil. And it's like, mm-hmm. do you love bread? Like, do you love some of that stuff? If you do, it's fine. Go eat it. Like if you don't want to do it because of some reason, you can try it. But like the best diet is the one you follow 90% of the time. Yeah. Um, same with training. Like I, I get these, these things from people who are like, uh, yoga is dumb. Pilates is dumb. And I'm like, Dude, if, if somebody loves doing that and they're not going to do anything regardless, then it's fantastic. Like, go do right. it. Uh, obviously, if you came to us for work, we would nudge you in a direction that's more resistance based. But like if, if we got somebody who's like not happening, then we'll do the best we can with what's available. We'll let them know sort of the pros and cons of the choices, but we can make things work. Like you can make a lot of things work. Um and like you said, it's way more important to consistently be active, way better for your body, way better for your golf, um, than stopping and being sedentary. Terrible. That's a terrible thing, not just for your golf, but for like your general well-being. It's a just terrible thing to be sedentary. Life. Yeah. Yeah. 
Makes a lot of sense. Well, hey, Drew, um, thank you so much again for for jumping on with us for the second time. Um, yeah. This conversation was was just as fun and just as enlightening as the first. Uh, you had mentioned next year um, a few times here. That's that's the uh, you know that's the um, the, the company like that you work business. for. Yeah, coaching. Um, you know, uh, f- fitness coaching, physical tr- training coaching, with a, a quite a bit of a golf emphasis um, because because you're as involved as you are. So. Um, I'll be sure to to link um, uh, next year's information so you can check it out if uh, if any of the listeners are interested in um, kind of stepping up their their physical fitness um, game as it relates to to golf. Um, but um, again, thank you very much for your time. We really do appreciate it. It was fun, and I hope we get to not only speak again, but uh, but link up and play some golf at some point. I'd love to see uh, I'd love to see a 380 yard drive in person. <laughs> yeah. no, it'd be good all right be well cool all right thanks.